I thought it would be a good idea as we get started today uh, to take just a moment to mark the one year anniversary of COVID in our lives. Uh, we prefer to remember and to celebrate good and fun things. I think it is often useful to also remember some of the, the difficult times in our lives. I know um, we got out of town uh, for a couple of days um, for mine and Steph's anniversary. Two years ago when we did that, um, we had to cross a flooded road to get back. And when we came back, there was flooding all over the area. Last year when we did that, we came back and had had to cancel services for COVID. So I'm just giving you fair warning. Who knows what's going to happen this year? But this is the month for it. So, all right. I love tall tales. These traditional stories that are used to teach lessons. Um, I love them so much that when I was still in elementary school, uh, I collected different fables and different tall tales from different cultures and wrote them in a notebook. That is the special kind of nerd that I am and was even when I was in the fifth grade. I love tall tales. And um, in the United States, there are a few different traditional uh, characters that, that have tall tales often told about them. And one of the most famous, one of the most popular is Paul Bunyan. Now, you all know Paul Bunyan, right? I mean, not personally, but you know who Paul Bunyan is. Paul Bunyan uh, was a, a traditional figure for uh, loggers and woodsmen in the Northwoods country, especially around the area of Minnesota and Wisconsin. And he was known for being a giant and for cutting down trees. Now, he had a companion, an animal that came with him everywhere. You know Paul Bunyan's companion? Babe, the giant blue ox. And I love the stories they tell about Babe, the giant blue ox. For instance, do you know why Babe, the giant blue ox is blue? Well, because they got cold, froze. Um, one of my other favorite stories about Babe, the giant blue ox goes like this. And this is the part of the story I'm nervous to tell you because it's March and that means something terrible is going to happen. And this is about a snowstorm. So I take, I take the blame if it happens. It's my fault just for talking about it. There was in Minnesota, once upon a time, a huge, huge snowstorm. It was snowing for days and days and days. And the wind was blowing the snow almost sideways. And it was creating this huge, huge buildup inches and then feet and then more feet deep. And Paul Bunyan needed to be able to get back to the woods so he could cut down some trees because that was his job. And he said, what are we going to do? How am I going to get rid of all this snow? The snow is so deep that it's covering the top of the trees and we have to find a way to get rid of it. So what he did is he went to a friend of his who was uh, a smith and had a giant pair of glasses made for, ba for Babe, uh, the giant blue ox. Had a giant pair of glasses made. And do you know what he put in the glasses? Green lenses. Why did Paul Bunyan put green lenses in the glasses? Because then, when Babe put on the glasses, I mean, he, he had to have somebody help him. He was an ox. But when he put on the glasses... He saw all the snow and it was green and he thought it was grass and he thought it was grass higher than the tops of the trees. And so Babe, the giant blue ox, went around eating everything that was green until all the snow in Minnesota was entirely gone. That's a true story. No, it's not a true story. Mm. What Babe the Giant Blue Ox saw changed his behavior. What Babe the Giant Blue Ox saw, the way that he saw what was around him 
completely changed how he did everything. So often when we read scripture, when we hear about the things that Jesus said or did, we want to do our best to understand them intellectually. We want to get it into our minds. We want to get our minds around the things of God. And so Jesus will give us these instructions, will tell us these stories, and we want to do our best to understand it well. And that is great. That is a good start. But when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to the kingdom of God, the important thing is not so much what we know, it is how we see. Babe the giant blue ox knew that there had been a giant snowstorm, but the glasses, the lenses through which he saw the world changed the ways that he did things. Jesus told parables often. That was his primary way of teaching people. And what parables do is not give us more information about the world. They don't give us more true things to know about the world. What parables do is they change how we see the world around us. They give us lenses through which to see God. They give us lenses through which to see the people around us. And when we change how we see, it change, changes how we act. We're going to be in Luke chapter 15 today, and we're going to read three of these parables. Now, the reason that we're reading three parables is because these parables all go together. Not just that they have a similar message, although they do, but they form a larger whole, a larger unit. Where if you just read one of them completely by itself, you're going to miss the larger point of what Jesus was talking about and about what Luke was doing by putting these stories together. So we're going to start out with Luke chapter 15, starting with verse 1. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, that is Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having 10 silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. 
Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, but when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. May God bless the reading and hearing of just a portion of God's word. I already said that there is a deeper unity to these three parables. That they're distinct parables, but they all have a similar message, at least at the beginning. And so we're going to see them all together as a unit. And we're going to look at the different things that this has to say to us. And how this can change not just what we know about God. Not just what we know about others, but about how we see. First of all, this parable, and especially the last one, this parable is famous for showing us about how God sees us. These parables teach us about how God sees us. In each of these three parables, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, the parable of the lost Son, in each of these three stories, the person who is looking is distraught. The person who is looking is upset because of what they had lost, and they are desperate, desperate to get back what they had lost. What they had lost was of incredible, incredible value to them. The sheep, the coin, the son were all of inestimable value to the one who had lost them. And so as they are found, there is rejoicing in that household. This teaches us about how God sees us. God sees us as of inestimable value. We matter so much to God. One of the songs that we sang this morning, I love because it talks about God's overwhelming love for us. God's love for us is not something that God is reluctant to give, not something that God gives grudgingly, not something that we have to earn, not something that we have to make happen. God thinks we are valuable. God thinks you are valuable and loves you, loves you more than anything. And that is the first meaning of this parable, of these parables together. And that's the one that we talk most about. These parables are about a God who loves. About a God who loves not counting the cost. It doesn't matter what it costs to God to get us back. God is willing, willing to pay up to and including the life of his son. God loves you more than anything. But the parables don't stop there, do they? The parables help us to see things differently because if that is true, if that is who God is, if that is how God loves, what does that mean about how we see 
God? What are the lenses through which we see who God is? When we start to talk about God, there are images that pop into our minds. There are phrases. There are ideas about who God is and about how God works. And these parables, I think, can act as a corrective to some of the bad pictures that we have. How many times when we picture God, do we see what Michelangelo saw on the Sistine Chapel ceiling? An old man with a flowing white beard, incredibly muscular and powerful, reaching down, deigning to touch the finger of Adam and give to him the spirit of life. And even the look on his face as Michelangelo was painting, he looks angry about it. He, he looks as though he is frustrated to have to bend down, to touch the earth, to be near humanity. We have these pictures of God as angry. These pictures of God as wrathful. These pictures of God as needy. Where God is just waiting, just waiting for you to mess up. So that you can get zapped with the lightning bolt. These pictures of God who is so wrathful that it had to spill out on something or someone. And Jesus was the only good and pure enough thing for that wrath to spill onto. We have these pictures of God as angry. And then here we have these parables. We have these parables where God is not pictured as angry, where God is not pictured as wrathful, where God is not pictured as waiting to punish. We have a God who is searching desperately for what is lost. We have a God who is looking everywhere for the coin that is missing, sweeping the floor, looking all through the house. We have a God who is leaving the 99 to go off on this one hill after this one sheep who is so completely lost that he may never be found again. We have a God who is not angry, who doesn't kick the sheep off of a cliff because he's angry. We have a God who searches. We have a God who looks. We have a God who loves. A God who is love. And even in the last story, the story of the lost son, we have this picture of a father. And that is a consistent picture of God throughout scripture. And maybe that is a great picture of God for you. Maybe you had a father who loved you well. Maybe you had a father who modeled the character of God, who loved you no matter what. Maybe you had a father who cared for you no matter what. But if you didn't, Jesus is here to correct that picture. Jesus is here to correct the picture. Jesus is here to give us a picture of a God who sees you off in the distance. And in a time and in a place, in a culture where men did not run, where men did not hug, where men did not embrace, this God drops everything and runs, runs to the one who is lost, embraces him, and kisses him, and throws him a party. Doesn't give him a lecture about how he should have spent his money like I would do. But just embraces him, welcomes him, welcomes him back in. First of all, these parables tell us about how God sees us as dearly loved. These parables also give us lenses through which to see God well as a God who loves, as a God who cares, as a God who is merciful, merciful, as a God who is gracious, who goes over and above and beyond what we can ask or think or imagine. I've heard it said, that justice is when we get what we deserve. Mercy 
is when we don't get what we deserve. And grace is we get when we get more than we could possibly deserve. This is a lens through which to see the heart of God as one who is gracious. Not just not giving us what we deserve, but giving us more than we could possibly deserve. Welcoming, welcoming us, inviting us back into his household whenever we walk away, whenever we're lost. So I think this can give us lenses through which to see God anew. But also, this can give us lenses through which to see one another. These parables give us lenses through which to see the other people around us. Why do I think that? Remember I said I think all three of these go together as a unit. There is an introduction at the beginning. There is a closing moment at the end. As we think of each one of these parables, and we tell the story of the parables, we tell the story of the lost sheep, that there is one sheep who walks away, and the shepherd goes after the one. We tell the story of the lost coin, that there's a woman who has ten coins, one is lost, she sweeps the entire house, looks everywhere to find it. And then there's the story of the lost son, the prodigal son, who runs away and comes back and is welcomed. But the story doesn't start there. The story doesn't end there either. Where does the story start? The story starts with Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners. Jesus is talking to people that in his day were not respectable folks. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were upset about it. And they get angry. They say, why is he eating with these people? And it made them uncomfortable. Why are you talking to these people? Do you know what they've done? Do you know who these people are? Jesus didn't argue. Jesus didn't justify. Jesus didn't explain. Jesus started telling stories. And he started telling stories about things that were lost and then were found. And there was great rejoicing at the finding. And then he tells the third parable. He tells the parable that we know as the parable of the prodigal son. Prodigal means lavish, wasteful, over the top, too much. And we've already talked about the fact that, yes, the son was prodigal, but the God was prodigal too. The father was prodigal. The prodigal who uh, the father who welcomed the son back in, even though he had disrespected him, even though he had spent all of his money, even though he had broken up all of the father's wealth so that he could go and spend it in riotous or dissolute living, whatever that meant. We know what the older brother thought it meant. Even then, the father was prodigal too. The father was lavish. The father was wasteful with his love, gave over and above and more than was warranted and necessary. But the story doesn't end there either. The story ends with the other brother, the elder brother coming in, and the elder brother was angry at the father. He said, Don't you see what he has done? He wasted, wasted your money. He split up your land. He broke the entail so that he could take this money and do goodness knows what with it. And then he comes back. And what do you do? What do you do? You throw him a party. You didn't throw me a party. I have been here the whole time. I have done what you have asked. I have worked for you. I have worked my fingers to the bone. And what have you done for me? And then the father says, Son, you are always with me. And all that I have is yours. But we had to do this. 
because my son was lost and now is found. The bookends of this story are not about how we see God or how God sees us. The bookends of this story are about how we see other people. They're about our lenses for viewing people who right now seem far from the love of God. How do we view those around us? The people who are pre-repentant sinners. The people who are not yet near to the love of God. The people who have not yet accepted. The people who have not yet followed. How do we see those people? How do we treat them? How do we think of how God sees them? Because the older brother knew how the father should view the older son. He thought he should be angry. He thought he should be wrathful. He said, now, now is the time to bring the hammer down. Now's the time for punishment. Now's the time for wrath. If you want to throw a party, throw it for me. The bookends of this story are about how we see the people around us. If we have been in our father's house for a long time, that tendency can be deep within us and it can pop up in unexpected ways. It's not something that we consciously think. It's not something that we try to do. We don't look out at people around us and say, I don't think God can love them. We never would say that. And yet, and yet, when we look at people around us, what lenses do we see them through? Do we see them through the lens of what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong? Do we see them through the lenses of discipline and punishment? How can they be brought back to the right road? Do we see the people around us through the eyes, through lenses of wrath and anger? God must be so angry at what they're doing. I admit, that is often me. I believe that I know what God has called me to do. And when I see people not living up to that, when I see people messing it up, when I see people that I think ought to be loving people well and they're not, and they're speaking for Christians and they're not loving people well, it is so, so difficult for me not to be the older brother. It is so, so difficult for me not to say, why are you not doing this right? God is so angry at what you're doing. It is difficult for me to see through the lenses of the Father. To see through the eyes of a God who loves, who chases after, who leaves the 99 in order to go after the one. And that is what we are called to do. These three parables go together as a unit because it's not just about how God sees us, although that is a profound message from this. It's not even just about the lenses through which we see God, although that is a profound implication of this. These parables are about how we see, the lenses through which we see people who are right now not doing what God wants them to do. People who are not living up to what God has called them to do. People who are outside of the love and grace of God by their own choice, by their own admission. This is about how we see them. This is about how we treat them. This is about our lenses for the outside world. So my invitation to you today is first of all, first, foremost, and always recognize and know God's deep, deep love for you. God loves you. Jesus died for you. And the Holy Spirit is here with you and for you. My invitation to you today is to look at God through these lenses. When we want to know who God is, the fullness of God is seen in the person of Christ. If we want to know what God is like, we see Jesus 
living, dying, and raised to new life. And last, my invitation to you is to use these lenses to carefully view the people around you. Whether they are Christians that you think are getting it wrong, whether, whether they are people who used to be Christians and left the fold, whether they are people who know nothing about the faith at all, my challenge to you is to use the lenses of the prodigal father to see those people through, to see them with love, to see them with grace, to see them with compassion and kindness. Because that seeing differently can change everything for us. That seeing differently can change our behavior. It's not just about what you know. It's about how you see. Would you all join me in prayer this morning? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather in worship, to be able to sing our praises to you, to be able to hear from your word, and now, God, to be able to gather together around your table. God, we know that none of us have done enough to be worthy of meeting around your table, but that you have considered us worthy because of your love for us and because of your son's sacrifice for us. God, we thank you and we love you and we trust you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So it is the first Sunday of the month. We are going to be gathering around God's table today. So if you are at home, uh, go ahead and gather the elements, your uh, juice and your bread, your cup and your loaf. Go ahead and gather those today. Uh, if you're in the building and you don't have those yet, I believe we still have some on uh, tables on both sides, the front door and the back door, as we prepare to meet God around God's table today. We meet around this table together not because we are worthy, not because we have done enough good things, but because God so loves us. Because of God's love for us, because of God's care for us, we are all invited to God's table. So join me around God's table today. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after eating, Jesus took the cup, poured it out, and said, This is my blood of the covenant poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you all join me in prayer? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God, we thank you for your love and your sacrifice for us. We thank you for the nourishment of the bread and the example of the cup of being broken and poured out for others. God, we ask that you would bring us together in communion, that you would make us one through these acts, through these remembrances, and through your Holy Spirit living in us and through us. God, we thank you for everything you do for us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this is a reminder that on the first Sunday of the month after communion, we uh, participate in a fellowship 
offering. Uh, this is a special offering that we take uh, to care for those who are part of our church family who are in need. Uh, so we do have um, a special offering plate uh, down front this week for those of you who are in the building or if that's something that those of you who are online would like to designate, uh, that's a, an option that's available as well. So may the love of God and the peace of Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. And may you go to love and serve your God by loving and serving your neighbors. Go in peace.